to awaken the power of an academic medical center and their, resource, re, their research-based institutions like Indiana University and Moore University. We should measure their success not just in terms of publications and profits, but also in terms of population health outcomes. After all, if we do the best research in the world, but that research uh, is not translated back into improved population health, if that research is health research, what have we accomplished? And if we train, or my colleague in Kenya trains the best medical student in the world, but that student graduates into a dysfunctional health system that robs him or her of hope and spurs him to migrate to another country, what have we really done for the health of the people right now in Kenya who don't have access to health care? Instead, let's try a different approach. Let's dare to lead with care. That is, let's roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty in the actual delivery of health services, but do that in such a way that we create a health system that hosts research and hosts training so that at the end of the day, no one of those three missions, care, research, or training, are any more or any less important than the other two. Well, let's jump back to 1990. At that time, Indiana University partnered with Moy University in Kenya to help bring up that country's second medical school. During the first decade, we focused on teaching medical students, doing collaborative research, and caring for patients at the Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital. Unfortunately, we can get this working here. Unfortunately, by the year 2000, the HIV AIDS epidemic had exploded across that continent, and though we here in the United States had uh, access to the triple drug therapy that transforms this certain death sentence into a chronic manageable disease, the story was very different in Kenya. Walk into virtually any community, and this is the sort of scene that you would see repeated over and again, a grandmother caring for her gaggle of grandchildren, the parents dead of AIDS. Efforts to prevent the epidemic had been a crushing failure, and many around the world doubted Kenya's capacity to control this problem. But that all began to change with this gentleman, Daniel Ocheng, dying on the wards of that teaching and referral hospital of, of AIDS. He was started on the triple drug cocktail that transforms this to a chronic disease, and for the first time in the public sector in Kenya, we witnessed the, the Lazarus effect of these drugs, and Daniel walked out of the hospital and inspired us with hope. On paper, initially, we created AMPATH, the academic model providing access to health care. And when I say we, I really mean Kenyans and Americans working together, and predominantly Kenyans, and always under the leadership of Kenyans. We started, Kenyans and Americans, two clinics, one in the hospital and one in the rural health center at a town of Mosoriot. Importantly, we made an unwavering commitment, an unwavering commitment to developing an electronic information system. Uh, this enables the complex integration that's necessary for any successful care system, and it invites cutting-edge technology to enable us to discover and make the next leap forward. Uh, our first patients, such as Nancy, convinced us very quickly uh, that Kenyans are as adherent, if not more adherent, to their medications than we are here in the United States. And patients like Mary, getting up from her deathbed and walking back into her community, demonstrated the courage to fight the stigma associated with this disease and to inspire her own fellow citizens. From two clinics, we went to four, and then eight, 16, 25 clinics. Currently, we're in over 500 sites uh, spread around Western Kenya. It's the largest HIV control program in, the, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, one of the largest in the world, and serves a population of nearly three and a half million people. Along the way, though, we learned a number of very important lessons, and Selena taught us one of our first. My colleague, Joe Mamlin, caring for Selena, started her on antiretroviral drugs, and though she, she, she didn't die, she also didn't get better, until Joe realized that Selena and her children were slowly starving to death. So then each week when Selena came into clinic, Joe dipped his hand into his pocket, pulled out a few shillings, and said, Selena, go buy some food for yourself and for your children. Selena did, 
and Selena got better. Now, HIV is a sexually transmitted disease, but the root cause of this pandemic and the misery that it extracts on our society goes far deeper to issues of gender inequality, poverty, and hunger. We responded to this first by creating our own farms and joining in partnership with World Food Program, and soon we're feeding 30,000 people every day. And uh, we made a number of, uh, of uh, very hungry people very happy. But you would all would realize right away that this really is not a sustainable solution. And so reaching up to our friends uh, in Lafayette, uh, in the School of Agriculture at Purdue, and a little bit farther at the University of Notre Dame in the School of Business, uh, and linking them with their counterparts in Kenya, we began to develop programs, sustainable programs, in both the business and agricultural sectors. So, for example, in the slum of Kitali, uh, we organized women's groups to begin sack gardening. Uh, sack gardens are a wonderfully appropriate technology for individuals have, who have virtually no uh, assets at all, no land or any other assets. And it's a simple technology whereby one takes a little gunny sack, fills it with soil in just the right way, plants seedlings on the top and uh, through holes along the bottom. And with this, a family of five can produce enough vegetables to meet their daily requirements with just three of these. And with four or five of these sacks, they can then produce enough uh, vegetables to sell in the market uh, to earn a few shillings. We learned the hard way that microloans in this population are not very successful. But then we learned that if we could bring together small groups of men and women, and usually it's women, to loan the little bit that they had to themselves and to help them manage those assets themselves, in fact, then we could help thousands, and in fact did help thousands of men and women, take the first step up to that first rung of the ladder towards self-sufficiency. And then reaching out to farmers groups, particularly subsistence farmers, we we're able to organize them into cooperatives and many of these co-opters now have become very successful, competing, for example, for tens of thousands of dollars of forward delivery contracts from World Food Program. And at least one of these cooperatives now at the point where they're producing enough cereals that they're donating it back to the needy in their own community. In effect, a very sustainable, Kenyan-owned, Kenyan-operated community food bank. <clears throat> there are many other problems and other challenges. Uh, for example, a pregnant woman infected with HIV has a nearly 50% chance of transmitting that virus to her child, to her newborn. But if, if that individual is started on antiretroviral therapy, the likelihood of transmission drops from 50% down to less than 5%. So knowing this, uh, at the very inception of our program, we were very aggressive at instituting uh, anti uh, uh, a, uh, HIV uh, treatment clinics within every antenatal uh, clinic. But what we soon realized was that a lot of women simply didn't come in to clinic. And even worse, what we discovered was that in this population of women who never came in the clinic and were out in the community but never came in, their prevalence of HIV in that population was two to three, sometimes four times higher than in the women coming to clinic, stated differently, though even though we might do a perfect job for all women in clinic, we still were failing to prevent most cases of HIV transmission from mother to child. So, uh, our solution here, if the women would not come to us, we would go to them, organizing cadres of health workers, uh, out, stepping out of our uh, ivory tower, onto the road, over the river, into the schistosomiasis, through the woods, past the lurking crocodile, and into the homes. Our counselors and path counselors went testing and counseling, not just every pregnant woman, but in fact, every man and woman who had the po potential to engage in sexual intercourse. And so here, our results were simply remarkable. Greater than 98% of households welcomed AMPATH's testers and counselors into the household. And since inception now, we've We've enrolled more than 160,000 HIV-infected individuals, and even better, our transmission rate from mother to child is, in fact, less than 5% now. If...
Even better, what scientific evidence now suggests is that if we can get enough individuals in the community enrolled on care, we in fact will be able to stop this pandemic and we believe Ampath is on track to doing just that. Now, as our success in HIV control uh, multiplied, uh, we began to turn our attention to issues of comprehensive primary health care irrespective of HIV status. So, for example, linking with uh, Indiana University's pediatricians, with obstetricians from Toronto, University of Toronto, and linking them with Kenyan counterparts, we're addressing issues of maternal child and neonatal health. Uh, we're addressing issues of health system strengthening by, for example, linking Purdue University pharmacists with their counterparts in Kenya to assure constant, safe, and secure drug supply. And we're addressing, addressing other issues of, safe water, of primary health care, such as safe water. So this is where we're at now in 2013. Uh, transitioning our entire HIV control program into a primary health care, primary care control and management program, in many ways getting us back to the goals that we set out to accomplish when we linked with them in 1990 in the first place. But along the way, we've learned something very interesting. The Kenyans, unfortunately, are becoming a bit more like us. We're now seeing burgeoning epidemic of diabetes, hypertension, chronic lung disease, uh, on, uh, cancer, and, and cardiovascular disease. So our response, March 2013, uh, we're breaking ground on the first building in East Africa dedicated to the care and control of chronic diseases, and here applying the same principles and approach that we used in HIV. The first two floors are going to be for care, next floor for research, and the top floor for education. Linking uh, our colleagues at Duke University now and Brown University and in Indiana with our colleagues in Kenya. We've already uh, been bringing up a center of excellence in oncology and in cardiopulmonary diseases. And here again, the principle is the same. Anchored in a tertiary care center, uh, the uh, reach of this control program will go all the way out to the farthest reaches of our, remote, of our most remote community. I'd like to reflect just a little bit on the keys, three keys that I think were, were, uh, uh, were key to our approach uh, here and our success here. One was this relentless emphasis on leading with care. For sure, uh, research and education are critical components of the tripartite academic mission. Uh, and AMPATH uh, has been very successful in, attrac in attracting research funds. Here, 60 million over the last five years, and this is not inclusive of the tens of millions that we've spent uh, on care. But the bottom line is that what makes that research legitimate and what enables that research is that it has been created on the platform of a care delivery system. We lead with care, and we leave nobody behind. The second key to our approach is, if, 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 to be successful here in the global sphere, if one draws a circle around what, how one defines oneself and one's university, that circle needs to encompass not just the community that we're serving, but it needs to encompass as well all of our partners. In many ways, the success of AMPATH is a reflection of the North Americans, the North American universities, to collaborate, to cooperate, to be inclusive, and to be unfailingly respectful of host Kenyan leadership. And then uh, the third key uh, to our approach here, to our success, is the T in TED Talk, and that is technology. We, um, the, the, we as I said, made an unwavering commitment to it to anchor both research and care, and it is the open MRS platform that that is, that is the platform for our electronic medical record system, the AMPATH medical record system. This was developed by AMPATH's investigators and scientists. It, proof of concept was demonstrated within AMPATH in Kenya. And now uh, this open MRS platform uh, has been adopted by more than uh, 40 countries worldwide. It's just a terrific example of bi-directional innovation. In the last couple of minutes, I would like to uh, in, uh, introduce you to just a couple of our patients here. Uh, this is Rose. Rose, HIV infected and dying, was treated with both antiretroviral drugs and food. And she's coming back now to the clinic with a bag of onions and potatoes in her right hand. And she's offering it to them and, in effect, to you, saying thank you. 
Thank you for her life, because if she had not been kept alive, her children would have perished. And uh, here is Pamela. Uh, Pamela, beautiful young lady of uh, 18 years. Uh, this photo was taken uh, about 13 years ago. Pamela was not HIV infected, but she was afflicted with rheumatic heart disease. Uh, rheumatic heart disease is completely preventable uh, and, if uh, contracted, uh, treatable with uh, medications and or surgery. Unfortunately, uh, at that time, they did not have an appropriate primary health care system, and Pamela died. She and thousands of young people like her inspire us to do a better job at bringing up primary health care systems. And then there's this little tyke uh, whom I met uh, 15 years ago and whose name I never knew. He died of Burkitt's lymphoma shortly after this photo was taken. But this little guy, this little guy paved the way for the Ampath Oncology Center of Excellence that today, right today, is successfully treating hundreds of patients uh, like Linda. Linda, her parents were dead of, uh, died of uh, HIV, both her mother and her father. She was being cared for by her maternal aunt. Her maternal aunt brought her into the clinic with a belly full of cancer that had metastasized to her bones. Thought sure to die, she was started on chemotherapy. The uh, cancer melted away, and now 14 months off of chemotherapy, Linda is thriving. In closing, I'd simply, uh, I'd like to thank, thank you uh, for uh, being here this, this morning. I'd particularly like to do a shout out to Alice Leake if she's in the audience. She is an octogenarian who in many ways, uh, she and her husband uh, in the French department at IU, planted the seed for much of this program back in the late uh, uh, mid-1970s. I certainly would like to thank you for being a part of this uh, journey with uh, me this morning. Um, as, uh, as you go uh, home uh, tonight and wrap your arms around your loved ones, I just invite you to ponder the connectedness of our global community, and I hope you will celebrate the lives of people like uh, Daniel and Nancy and Mary and Rose, I'm sorry, and Selena and Rose, and Pamela, and Linda, and those hundreds of thousands of individuals whose names you will never know. I urge you to reach out to them. It just might change your life forever. <laughs>